Okay. Well, um, welcome back, everyone. And I know you are going to get a 15 minute break after this segment. So hopefully, um, this will be at least relevant for some of you. And I will tell you, I don't do a ton of work with volunteer agencies, but um, last year, um, I do get these questions from time to time from AAA members and from others, other um, uh, organizations. Uh, what I will say is I built this presentation last year, I believe, because Kim, I think Kim had asked um, for a presentation around what's, it might've even been two years ago, um, what's permissible in the way of compensation for volunteer organizations. And so, um, you know, where this was going to be our first presentation this morning, as always, I appreciate the opportunity to come spend a little bit of time with you guys. I, I, I know the work that Kim, uh, well, I don't pretend to know the work that Kim puts in to make this happen, um, but I do know that it is a lot of work. I was the education chair for AAA for a lot of years. And as a result, I know that, you know, hurting everybody to get the speakers, and I mean hurting us, not the attendees, um, to try and get our stuff in to, to, you know, put together ideas and to and to make sure that it all happens is a lot of work. So I'm, I'm really grateful uh, to, to everyone for attending. So just quickly want to talk a little bit about our objectives for this session. So just we're going to, I'm going to give you a little bit about volunteerism and some data and statistics. We'll talk a little bit about understanding what's the current state of volunteerism in EMS to the extent that that information is available. What's the difference between an employee and a, a volunteer? Then we'll talk a little bit about the rules and regulations regarding um, volunteers and any compensation to volunteers. And then last, we'll talk a little bit about um, permissible practices for employers who utilize volunteer labor. So um, volunteerism is a general rule of thumb. Um, you know, uh, I've got a couple of hyperlinks here, by the way, in the presentations and those, uh, I sent the presentations to Kim, I think earlier this week. Um, uh, those links will take you to any underlying information that is uh, or was utilized in putting together the presentations. So what I try and do is make it super easy. If there are numbers or statistics or information on there and there's a hyperlink, I want you to know where I found it so that if you want to go research or read more on it, you certainly can. Um, so uh, a couple of surveys that are done, um, you know, and these are done by different, there's sort of the National Association of Volunteers or Volunteering and Civic Life in America. And um, what we know is there was a decrease in volunteerism from 19 to 21. If I had to venture to bet why that was, I'm going to guess that there was something that happened in the beginning of 2020 that may have curbed people's willingness to volunteer. Uh, and in particular, may have curbed people's interest in volunteering in EMS. So a lot of people who volunteer in EMS have full-time jobs. And what I heard from many, many people during the early days and the middle days of the pandemic were my full-time job has told me I cannot volunteer for my agency anymore. You know, in the goodness of their heart, they were like, well, geez, we don't really want our people who I need working getting sick because they're out helping other sick people. Um, understandable, but a little bit uh, short-sighted in my mind. But um, what we do know, though, is that while volunteerism as overall is down by about 7%, we do know that that's sort of, they actually survey both formal volunteerism, where people are volunteering for organizations, and then some informal helping or volunteerism. And they've said that that has remained relatively stable. In other words, the number of people helping out their neighbors or helping out others um, in an informal basis has remained relatively stable. And I think you know, probably part of that is that, um, like me in my fire department that I was on for 18 years, now technically we were paid, but we were paid like 50, 16 or $17. It wasn't very much. Um, and we were paid per hour when we did calls. Um, uh, you know, for me, I didn't necessarily do it for the money. I did it because I wanted to feel like I was helping my community in some way, shape or form. Um, I think um, that, so for me, it was almost informal. Um, you know, that is something that hasn't changed too dramatically because you don't feel like you've made this commitment to an organization. And in fact, the reason I stopped working for the fire department was they appointed 
uh, firefighters from June, from July to June every year. And I was really just not getting to the fire department very much. And I felt like I could no longer make that formal commitment. And so as a result, I'm one of the people who stopped working uh, uh, in EMS in 2020. But what we know generally is of those people, um, you know, uh, from volunteer, approximately 13% of the EMS workforce held a primary job in EMS as a volunteer. So what we're saying is, is that for, a, you know, a percentage of the folks who were working in EMS, that that job at, in EMS was a volunteer position. Now, when we go back to our cost collection information, which I know we presented on last year, what we know are 90.9% .9 of the ambulance services in this country bill Medicare less than 2,500 trips a year. 85% bill less than 1,500 trips per year, and I think it's 75% bill less than 500. So what we know are the majority of the ambulance services, not the majority of the trips, but the majority of the ambulance services in this country are small, rural, and super rural organizations. Now, volunteer, some more volunteer statistics, right? 65% uh, of the organizations were operating with reduced resources and 11% halted operations entirely last year. So um, we, you know, see this as sort of the impacts that COVID had on volunteerism as a whole. Um, so again, um, that probably is a, a huge portion of that 7% overall decrease that we saw in volunteerism. Now, behind me, you'll see this picture that is on this slide right here. This picture right here is from an article that the New Yorker did back in uh, January of 2019. So before the pandemic hit. And one of the things that they were talking about was this idea that rural ambulances, there were fewer and fewer people to volunteer and or to work in rural ambulance services. In other words, when I was growing up and worked at the town grocery store in my town, there were people that I worked with at the grocery store who were firefighters. And when the tone went off, they would leave their job because their job supported them in doing so, and they would go do run the fire call, and then they would come back and get back to work. They never got punched out. They, the business supported because they were part of the community. We're seeing less and less of that now. In fact, a lot less flexibility with employers. You know, if, for example, I know I have to get on an airplane to fly to, I went to Pennsylvania this week, I'm less likely when the tone goes off at one in the morning to get up and go to a call because I could get stuck uh, at the fire call. Had that happened multiple, multiple times over the course of my firefighting career. Um, the fact of the matter is, is changing economic realities, the changing structure of the way communities are, right? We're not finding as many people working in the community as um, in the communities that they live as they used to. So it is even more challenging to get out to uh, fire calls and the changing nature of the workplace. The one thing that I'll say that probably has shifted in the favor of uh, volunteering is the fact that more people are working from home, which does mean that they're at least in their community. The challenge is fewer employers are in a position where they're willing to allow um, you know, people to just basically pick up and take off at any time. So as you can see, this issue is just not a national one. Of course, you all know, um, I grabbed this article from uh, the Denver Post about underfunded, overworked, and urgently needed, essentially the state of EMS in rural Colorado. So I just want to briefly talk about what is a volunteer. Um, a volunteer generally, right, is an employee, you know, to employ, right, or sorry, definition of an employee, let me start there first, is essentially someone who suffer or permit to work for an employer. Employers must be paid at least minimum wage, um, and receive overtime for hours worked over 40. Of course, unless that employee is an exempt employee, which a lot of people uh, often struggle with the term exemption and not exempt. Um, but generally speaking, when employees are paid a per hour wage or a weekly salary, and if they then work over 40, they are paid overtime. But it's just really important to understand the difference between an employee and then someone who's a volunteer. So a volunteer is an individual who performs the hours of service for a public agency. So just so we're clear, an employee cannot volunteer for a private for-profit organization. It is not permitted, all right? That is not permitted. 
So a public agency for civic, charitable, or humanitarian reasons without promise, expectation, or receipt of compensation. All right. So in other words, you you are a volunteer. If, for example, you are volunteer, like we had people who volunteered um, at um, blood pressure clinics at, um, you know, in our town at the Council on Aging, et cetera. So that's a volunteer versus an employee. An employee generally is working for the promise of pay, whereas a volunteer is doing so sort of out of the goodness of their heart and for the civic or charitable reason, all right? Volunteer agencies, um, you can only volunteer for a nonprofit or a governmental agency, and you cannot volunteer, even if it's a nonprofit, right? You cannot volunteer for the same organization for which you get paid, right? So I have been in presentations, in fact, as Bell and I were in Texas, doing cost collection. And someone says, well, I have people who work, who get paid during the day, but then volunteer to calls at night. And we were like, he, he goes, I'm going to stop you right there. You need to talk to that guy over there. And after the session, I said, my friend, that is totally illegal. And the fines for that are enormous. So you cannot volunteer for the job. Now, I know many of you in leadership feel like you volunteer in some instances because your compensation may or may not necessarily may feel like you're not getting paid anything based upon the number of hours that you work. Now in the state of Colorado, there are some additional factors to help determine if someone is a volunteer or not, right? The activity is generally part-time, so you can't be a full-time volunteer. Um, the activities are the kind typically associated with volunteer work rather than paid employment. Um, services offered are are offered freely and without any coercion or pressure or promise. Um, uh, regular employees have not been displaced to accommodate for a volunteer. So in other words, you don't basically kick people out from paid positions so that you can use utilize volunteers. All right. Um, same type of service determination, right, does not permit an individual to perform hours of volunteer service for a public agency when such hours involve the same, same type of services for which the employee is um, serving in that public. So again, I'm a firefighter or I'm a, I, I happen to work in fire inspection. So I work for the fire department, but I'm a fire inspectional services person. I can't volunteer at night to do fire calls, right? I'm working for the same agency, performing essentially the same duties and really in that same occupational classification, right? So it even though, let's say, if I'm a firefighter during the day paid, I can't come back and do fire calls volunteer at night. If I'm a fire, I work in fire inspection or I issue permits during the day as a paid employee, I can't come back and do calls at night because it really is pretty similar, functionally the same thing, right? So same or similar has been determined to be people who are like cross, I can't be a firefighter during the day and then decide that I'll volunteer as an EMT on the ambulance at night. All right, firefighter, police officer, right? I can't be a firefighter full-time or a police officer full-time and then volunteer as a police officer or firefighter. We don't really see volunteer and police officers. You do see it more in firefighting. You know, you never see it in plumbing, just for the record. Never see a volunteer in plumbing. Be lovely if they would do it, but never, ever see it. It still blows my mind that there are places in this country that believe that we should get free public safety, right? That people should be expected while I appreciate their offer to do it. But I always say to people, and they go, Scott, you're a lawyer. Can I get some free legal advice? And I go, absolutely. It is gonna be worth everything you paid for it. So uh, if I'm a fire marshal or I'm a firefighter or I'm a mechanic for the fire department, I can't come back and do fire calls because again, it's the same entity or organization. Now. Can I be a firefighter full-time in Topsfield, but be a volunteer in Middleton, the next town over? Yes, I can do that, all right? Uh, that is permitted. So unless, of course, it's part of a county-based system, in which case, uh, while I'm working for Essex County Fire in Topsfield, I can't work as a volunteer for Essex County Fire in Middleton. That's not going to be permitted. So um, that same public agency issue generally is done on a case-by-case -case basis. And what they're really looking at is, hey, are there separate retirement systems, separate payrolls? You know, so I can't volunteer to be a police officer 
or yeah, I can't be paid police officer and come back as a volunteer firefighter at night. Again, same same organization, same town, right? You cannot do that. So um, just recognize, because a lot of people have gotten into a ton of trouble based upon not paying people or not recognizing or paying people appropriately. Now, I have to give the international, the IFC, a shout out because they have a great guide for Fair Labor Standards Act compliance as it relates to volunteer volunteerism and making sure that you don't run afoul of the Fair Labor Standards Act. I formally, when I went to law school, I started working for the United States Department of Labor because I knew I wanted to focus in employment. Um, that was in the year 2001, and I worked through 2004 for the United States Department of Labor. What I will tell you is, they just don't have a sense of humor there. Nobody okay. generally at the Department of Labor has a sense of humor. And, you know, the other thing I will tell you is, I remember when I decided to leave the Department of Labor to get back into EMS, I met with my regional director, Jim Banajas at the time. And I said, Jim, uh, he said, why are you leaving? I said, I got a great opportunity. I was already a firefighter at that point. I said, a great opportunity to work and, and run an ambulance service. And he said, really? Why are you, like, this is a great job. You know, we'll probably pay for your law school. You know, you'll get a great retirement. And I said, yeah, and I understand that. Thank you, but I'm going to go. He's like, why are you really leaving? I said, my supervisor is flipping awful. And he's like, you're quitting because of Janet? He goes, don't quit because of her. She's getting promoted. And I was like, Exactly. exactly. And then he goes, yeah, you're right. You better get out of here. So what I will tell you is DOL, no sense of humor. So don't screw around with whether you pay or don't pay people. Not a good idea. By the way, that doesn't mean that everybody at the DOL has no sense of humor. They do. They're lovely people. And by the way, doing God's work. But at the end of the day, they don't like it when people, when employees are not getting paid when they should be getting paid. So paying volunteers any kind of money or anything of value in exchange for their work is really dangerous. Like really, really dangerous, all right? I would say you need to be thinking really long and hard about paying any volunteer to do anything, all right? Now, what they say is you can pay what's called a nominal fee. All right. Now, you can always reimburse a volunteer's expenses or any fees that they may have paid. All right. But you need to be cautious that you're not paying more than, quote, a nominal fee. And I'll talk about what that is in a second. But the nominal fee cannot be functionally a substitute for a wage. That is just not permitted. So, what I will tell you is if you utilize volunteer labor and you're giving them money, you, you want to make sure that you're engaging some legal professional somewhere, and it won't even hurt to talk to a tax professional, but you want to make sure that you are looking at these pay programs with a strict liability comb, right? In other words, there isn't per se strict liability as it relates to this, but what I would say is you want to use a high level of scrutiny when it comes to dealing with any sort of reimbursement for um, for volunteers. So what does a nominal fee mean? Well, the IRS has come out several times on this and the Department of Labor, who by the way, both have jurisdiction. The Department of Labor has jurisdiction over the wage part of it. The Department of Revenue, the IRS, the Internal Revenue Service has jurisdiction over the taxability piece. And so what they have come out to say is generally, the nominal fee cannot be more than 20% of what you would have paid a full-time or a paid individual, part-time paid or full-time paid individual to do that job. All right. So as you think about, oh, all right, well, we are doing like a, a little per call fee or something, you know, we give them an extra or whatever. You need to think about, all right, what is the average wage? And we'll talk about this in a second. What is the average wage for an EMT in my market? Is what I'm offering to pay more than, is it 20% or more than what we would pay someone to do the job as a paid employee? If it is, then you really, really need 
to, uh, you're probably violating the law. And as a result, you're probably have an employee and not a volunteer. There are two uh, United States Department of Labor advisory opinions that are directly on point to this. And it strikes me that I forgot to put the hyperlink in there. But what I will tell you, if you type into whatever search engine you use, but I say Google, if you type into Google, US DOL advisory opinion, November 10th, 2005, volunteer, you're going to find it immediately. So there are two. One specifically has to do with the fire department, uh, which is sort of the closest thing that we could find. But the first one issued November 10th of 2005 was a, a custodian who was paid a stipend for, uh, you know, it was really, quote, a nominal fee for um, coaching a sports team. So the individual was serving as a coach, or in this instance, they could also, per se, uh, they also paid um, stipends to people who served in any sort of advisory capacity for extracurricular activities. Um, and what they said was that, hey, this guy got paid for coaching the varsity track team, and he got paid this amount for a number, number of years. So they gave that coach a stipend of thirty six seventy five a season for volunteering. And the coach was not required to coach any team. It was not a condition of his uh, employment. Um, uh, and basically, uh, that, that stipend was, was paid to whoever coached that team, regardless of whether they were an employee of the school. So in this instance, he was a custodian, but he was doing this coaching separately. Um, and it was really completely different character of work that he was doing. All right. So the stipend is not based on the amount of time. It was not based on whether they made the playoffs. He didn't get any additional money. Hey, you know, we'll bump that stipend to five grand if you make it to the playoffs. That, um, you know, again, it was not based on the length of the season. Um, also, it, it said that the... Um, you know, the custodian in this instance happened to use his own money to buy the athletes hamburgers and pizza because that's exactly what you want to feed track and track stars <laughs> is junk food. Uh, ice cream, it's always another good one, fuels that tank up really good. Um, and then, um, you know, this particular individual was using their own money to, to buy plaques and or trophies. Uh, and uh, again, these extras were sort of due to the fact that this person loved coaching. Um, we had a coach at my high school who coached um, the girls track team for 45 years. Uh, and they you know, were always winning. And, and he was a full-time teacher, but also got a stipend. And again, this stipend was, was deemed, you know, the way any advisory opinion, just like with the CMS OIG advisory opinions are, they say, hey, while this may follow a similar theme to your situation, this advisory opinion only has to do with um, this particular situation. And we're not necessarily saying this applies to any and all. So the other opinion that occurred in August uh, 7th of 2006, in which, by the way, they referenced the November opinion in 2005, really has to do with um, uh, an individual who, in this instance, was a uh, a a volunteer firefighter um, that they paid some dry cleaning expense for cleaning the the gear that the person used. That they provided some sort of um, they did provide some group some group insurance like a like a liability insurance in case anything happened. Uh, so they provided some what again was was nominal fees. There wasn't any specific number of hours that they had to work. There wasn't. They weren't coerced or um, essentially there was no implied or direct um, uh, pressure or coercion for the employee. The employee was not, um, did not otherwise, was not otherwise employed by another part of that same public agency. And um, essentially what they got at was, you know, consistent with the discussion of those factors that they talked about in the November one and uh, that the idea that this was, um, you know, sort of 
the factors that they discussed are, is this person expected to work 20, you know, be available 24 hours a day? You know, are they um, available? Uh, are they required to be in one particular place? There's an entire discussion around engaging to wait and waiting to engage. And so um, whether somebody is working or not working, uh, whether you based it on a per call or an hourly basis. So if your stipend is based on a certain number of hours, you probably have an employee, not a volunteer. If it's based per se upon a certain number of calls, you need to be really careful that you're not wandering into the piece rate, um, into the piece rate, uh, FLF, the rules regarding piece rate under the Fair Labor Standards Act. So I would just suggest for you that even if you paid that per call rate that you would take a look at, does it offend the nominal 20% number? So again, if you use, utilize volunteers and you compensate those volunteers in any kind of way, you want to do a really, really strong look at um, how you are doing so, what that amount is, what's the basis of the amount, make sure the rules are super, super clear. It is perfectly fine to reimburse expenses. It is perfectly fine to provide some level of reasonable benefit. Now, that being said, you can't give them all kinds of like, you know, Justice Thomas, who got like free vacations. You can't do that kind of stuff, not permitted, but you can do nominal fees or token gifts like a plaque for, you know, volunteer of the year. That kind of stuff is totally fine. Um, expenses that are permissible, um, you can uh, do meals, some level of transportation. In many states, uniforms, if the employee has is required to wear a uniform, and I say employee, if the volunteer, generally speaking, in a lot of places you're required to pay for that, um, it depends on the state, depends on the state, but um, uniforms you can reimburse for, uh, tuition or other costs for attending classes related to the volunteer services you could reimburse for, any of the books or supplies that are associated. Like let's say for example, you have a volunteer who's just a first responder but wants to go to EMT school and the organization is willing to fund that, that would very likely be okay. And as you can tell, I'm playing it perfect as a lawyer in this instance and saying very likely and may or should. I'm not saying absolutely is. Uh, other reasonable benefits, right? Um, a public employer can or doesn't risk that volunteer status by offering certain things like any of these, which by the way, look a lot like compensation to me, but the Department of Labor has decided that these are okay. Again, within reason, despite those, despite the rules are very, very clear. Now, um, nominal fees, uh, public employers may pay volunteers a nominal fee. The DOL has indicated that the public safety departments may um, consider the following factors, right? How far is someone traveling? Time and amount of effort that's expended, uh, whether that a person has agreed to be available, whether um, they provide the service throughout the year. I know people who volunteer for the Parks Department, uh, Federal Parks Department. They go out once, a, they spend the summer out in um, Yellowstone and they volunteer for the whole summer because they are at an age where they can do that. Um, that is perfectly fine. For that, they get housing during the summer months. They get you know a couple of other benefits. But again, you want to make sure that you're looking at this nominal fee issue. So permissible token gifts, right? Like if you're giving gift cards or gift certificates or pins or tote bags, that kind of stuff, again, is pretty okay. You still want to be careful though, giving a gift certificate for $500 could very well be problematic, okay? So you just want to be very, very careful. Um, permissible other for training, for um, if you send someone on a conference, if you... Um, had them if they if they were volunteering if you were giving them mentoring uh, services or um, you you know offered them some sort of uh, feedback mechanisms or any of those things those are all uh, forms of compensation that might that might be because again the IRS looks at it as if you got training you got something of value that you didn't pay for that would be income. What, what they're saying, though, is, hey, we will permit this not to be income for you. We'll also permit it to be a permissible remuneration, if you will, for um, for uh, the volunteerism. So per call basis, this is incredibly, incredibly, um, I would caution you 
to be very careful because generally the fee can't be tied to productivity, right? That comes back to when you look at the Fair Labor Standards Act, um, a piece rate meal where people get paid by piece rate or the number of things that they, the number of products they produce, et cetera. So um, you want to be, the nominal fee really can't be tied to productivity and it can't vary based upon the amount of time spent in the activity. So if, for example, you just had a compensation per call, well, that may very well be okay, provided again, that it doesn't go beyond that nominal fee. What you would have paid someone to do that call had they been an employee rather than a volunteer. Um, an hourly rate, again, a monthly stipend or an hourly rate, hour, hourly, I'm having a hard time speaking, an hourly rate, you just need to be incredibly, incredibly cautious. If in fact, it's like, let's say an annual stipend and that stipend is not dependent upon the number of calls that they attend or the number of hours that they are committed to doing this volunteerism for you, then it could be permissible, again, provided it doesn't go past that 20% uh, nominal rate, right? So they've stated that an individual is allowed, like that annual or monthly stipend is allowed, but you need to be super, super careful. The hourly stipend as well, again, you just need to be, you need to understand that if you pay an hourly rate, you have wandered off of the volunteerism path. You are just off of it, right? So anything that looks like an hourly wage, guess what? It is an hourly wage. And as a result, you need to pay minimum wage. So permissible, right? Just a quick example, a county fire department pays 50,000 to hire a full-time employee for one year. Fire department pays an annual stipend of $9,500 to a volunteer firefighter to perform the same services. This payment would constitute a nominal fee under the 20% rule. If in fact it went to $10,000, that would be a problem, okay? Makes sense? Questions? If it went to $15,000, well, then you would be over that 20% mark. And as a result, you would you this would be considered not a volunteer. This would be considered compensation. And then you might run into a problem with meeting the minimum wage. You might also run into the problem with making sure you paid overtime if that person worked. You know, in other words, no, volunteers can't volunteer full time. So... The way that you work this out is, right, step one, you evaluate whether each specific payment to the volunteer qualifies towards their expenses, towards their, you know, the reasonable benefit analysis or the nominal fee issue. Nominal fee cannot extend past or be greater than uh, that which you would have paid the full-time firefighter to do that same job. Um, you know, the 20% of what you would have paid a full-time firefighter to do that job and that the entire a uh, package of payments made to the volunteers in the context of the DOL always refers to something called the economic realities test. And just so we're clear, the economic realities test is, hey, if we take everything in the content, right, if we look at all of the financial realities around this particular arrangement, and at the end of the day, when we look at it, it looks and smells exactly like an employee, Right? the economic realities are this person really is an employee, well, then we're going to call them an employee. So this comes down to sort of, hey, if we look at it all and look at it in the context of what might be an employee, well, then guess what? We're going to consider this person to be an employee. So I just pulled the wages for an average EMT according to um, Glassdoor. Mm. What I would say is, these are averages, and I took the lower end of the average here. Now, um, what I would say is you can use whatever website you believe is appropriate, but what I would tell you is if the DOL comes knocking on your door, that you can point to the fact that you did the analysis, that it was reasonable based upon you, that you used reasonable source data, and that you did the calculation to make sure that you were under the 20% nominal fee. If, in fact, by the way, what they look at is that it wasn't reasonable, you're going to have a hard time. Um, again, DOL people, no sense of humor. They're lovely people, just no sense of humor. So just 
for a point of reference, I grabbed this off of um, off of Glassdoor last night, uh, 41 to 66,000. Now I looked at other websites and the numbers varied. Some were as low as 36, some were as high as 75. What I would say is take a look if you have both volunteers and paid employees. I would just take a look at what your average wage for your full-time employee is times 20% and whatever your stipend is, it better not be over that. Now, again, your full-time employee cannot also volunteer at night. Not that they would, but I just want to be, I want to be clear. Questions on this? Is the, the 41% that you have there, would that be their salary or salary and benefits? Great, great, great. So the 41,000 you mean? Yeah. Yeah. So the 41,000 in this instance, I believe is straight up wage, right? Not including benefits, at least because it was base pay with additional pay. And that would be additional pay is generally with things such as, um, you know, if they had a stipend, you know, for sometimes people will provide, a, you know, like a differential pay for other, you know, oh, one of your shifts is on a Saturday. That's my understanding is this is just wage. Now, it's a fair question because benefits are separate, generally permitted separately um, under DOL for, um, for volunteers. I would suggest that you want to be looking primarily at their total compensation as it relates to wage and salary, not per se benefits. Does that help? Yeah, so 20, it can't be more than 20% of their whole package. Well, so I believe, so here's what I would tell you is you're permitted for volunteers to pay for some benefits for them, right? In other words, you could pay for like um, uh, short-term or long-term disability that would be permitted. Now, I'm not suggesting that what you would do is take their wage and all of their health benefits and their 401k and all of that. What I think I would do with the first step is, hey, Let's take a look at what their top line wages are, their pay for that year, right? In other words, if they've got, if in fact you don't have any stipends, like, you know, you don't have any differentials because one of their shifts is on a Saturday for which you pay an additional $2 an hour. Great. We'll just keep it simple. Let's say that they're just their wages salary without any benefits is, you know, is $100 um, a week just for fees sake you would want to make sure that any any stipend that you paid to a volunteer would be less than $20 you know per, for that stipend does that make sense so it would be under 20% yes yeah. yeah and so because again the benefits are permitted now if you had some you know what what we go back to though is think about the economic realities right let's say for example that you know you were you were paying some other benefit program. Let's say you like for lack for just failure of being a little bit ridiculous. Let's just say you had some program where you paid um a hundred percent of their car payment for some reason, right? That to me is different. But if we're talking about health or long-term, short-term, that kind of stuff, they've already identified those benefits as segregated and permitted for volunteers. So I think what we're talking about here is strictly their wages and salaries less those benefits and i'll you know i'll do during the break because we got a 15 minute break coming up i'll confirm it any other questions questions so i, I have one for you scott so okay. i have numerous agencies who i absolutely know they are paying per hour to be not only on call but during calls, different amounts for on-call versus uh, during calls. Are you asking me if they're probably violating the law? Yes, I am. Yeah. Yeah. You know, you're never violating the law until you get caught. So the, 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 the thought that I had kind of soothed my conscience with was this uh, whole deal about ready to respond or responding to be ready, whatever. Yeah. However, Engaging to wait, waiting to engage. Right. So if you are, 
you've signed up for a shift, you get paid a dollar an hour to have signed up for this 12 hour shift. You're, you're not at the station, you're at home, you can go to the ball game, you do whatever, but you can't leave the county. Yep. So, so are, they, are they bound or are they not bound? No, great question. That's, that's one that comes up pretty, pretty frequently. So if they're, if they're getting paid a dollar an hour to just be they're they're really waiting to engage, right? And to the extent that they're restricted, they're not really restricted from going to the grocery store, going to the mall, provided they stay in their county, right? Or their whatever that area is. If they had to be at the firehouse or at the ambulance station, in my opinion, <laughs> that's hours worked, right? So we're coming down to when we're talking about whether they're engaging to wait or waiting to engage, we're really talking about whether those are working hours. Right. So if I'm paying a volunteer, if I give a volunteer a dollar an hour just to potentially volunteer or to be available, in my opinion, that is under 20 percent of what you would have paid a full time or a part time person to do that call. Right. Because, again, if we were talking about 20 percent, that would be five dollars an hour. That's way below what you would have paid. A, a part-time, full-time person to do that. So I think that would very likely be permissible. Now, if what we're talking about is I've got a full-time employee who I pay a dollar an hour to be available at night, right? Because, right, not, it's not, they're not really, the question is, is are those working hours for the purposes of calculation of overtime, right? For under the Fair Labor Standards Act. And in my opinion, if they're not having to sit at the station, they're relatively free to use their time as they see, with the exception of, hey, you can't leave the county, then I would, my opinion, my legal opinion is that those are not, those they are waiting to engage. And as such, those are not working hours. Now, the second the tone goes off and they begin to respond, those are working hours, and that would be payable and compensable under the Fair Labor Standards Act. Now, if they're a volunteer, and essentially nothing changes when the tone goes off, right? They just get this dollar to be in the county. Um, then I would say they're a volunteer. Does that help? But if the if, yes, thank you. But if the the tone has now gone off, and now they're getting paid ten dollars an hour, that is not right. Yeah, no. So my, my feeling is if the tone goes off and they're getting paid by hour, right? We As we showed, I think, a couple of slides back, where is it, um, right? DOL has determined that payment to a volunteer firefighter on a per hour basis destroys the bona, bona fide volunteer status and creates an employment relationship. So by the way, just so you guys know, I always say to my clients, I'm not your minister, priest, or your rabbi. I, I am a lawyer, right? So I was born without a conscience. So what I would say is, I, lots of people come to me and say, you won't believe what happened. And I always go, look, no one set out and said, like, today I will underachieve like I've never under, I'm going to break the law in four ways. And not get it. Well, there are a few people who have done that. But what I would say is, for the most part, people kind of back into that by accident and then they find out they're doing something they shouldn't be doing. And what I always say to them is, look, once you know, you sure as hell better fix it. You're not less liable. In fact, you're more liable once you know it's illegal. So what I'd say are, are there a lot of agencies out there doing stuff that's probably illegal? Yes. Just like, by the way, I will bet you that 75% of the ambulance services in this country are violating HIPAA right now. Why? Because they have not done their risk, their required risk assessment to evaluate the administrative, technical, and physical safeguards tied to HIPAA, right? That's a requirement, mandatory. And so, but people, people decide how they value which law they break, right? It's like the speed limit, right? Most, I speed a little, what's the big deal, right? You know, it's either wrong or it isn't wrong. So, um, but what I would say is, yes, here's the thing. Um, if they're paying people on an hourly basis, it destroys the volunteer and they are employees. Now, the problem they run into is they're probably violating the Fair Labor Standards Act, which means 
that um, and more than likely the wage act in your state and in most states the wage act violations are triple damages plus attorney's fees so if over the course of the year i paid out you know a thousand dollars in that per hour call but i was supposed to have paid out thirty thousand dollars in that call it's now 90 plus attorney's fees so um and it, I have another question from a, another very frontier service. Go for so it. What about a person working for another organization within a parent company and receiving a paycheck monthly and then being considered a, in quotes, volunteer for another company within the same parent organization, such as a maintenance employee at the main facility, then working as a volunteer EMT for the ambulance service that is owned by the same parent organization? So I'll, what I'll use is the analogy that the fire department, uh, the August of 2007 letter said, would a fleet mechanic for the fire department be able to volunteer as a firefighter or an EMT? And the answer was no. What I would say, though, in that instance is that was the exact same organization, right? I mean, it was the exact, like, but the economic realities are that the parent company owns the company for which this person maybe is a custodian or I think is what you said but then also operates. The question would be is, are the duties different enough? Um, my, what I always say to people are, at the end of the day, I would probably pay that person because of my gut is, it is the same employer, just happens to be a different role or a different job. And you may not volunteer for an employer when you get paid to do a job, right? I can't. If my employer is like, hey, Scott, I know you worked on the ambulance, but I'm, we're like getting our asses kicked in billing, you know, and I go, oh, man, I'll come in and I'll just I'll volunteer to code all those claims for you, legal or not legal. Totally different job. Totally illegal. Right. Oh, you know what? I'll come in and clean all those ambulances off duty. Right. Because I know we're getting ready for inspection. I'll come in. I'll volunteer my Saturday. Now, I used to volunteer in an honor guard. Um, and I used to go to the EMF Memorial every year with an honor guard. And um, that was not providing or furnishing emergency medical services. We were doing an honor guard service, and that would be a permissible volunteer uh, role. Do I think the Department of Labor would think it's permissible? I think they might even look at it a little bit sideways. But, um, but no, I think in that instance, because the duties were completely separate, because it was a civic or charitable reason, right? Or a humanitarian reason. I think that would be permitted. In this instance, uh, if, if I were advising that organization, my answer would be, you probably should be paying that person. Okay, thank you. Uh, but I, by the way, I'm not barred in the state of Colorado, but the reason I'm not there is because I have been barred from the state of Colorado. No, I'm kidding, I have not. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so any other questions anything online i'm looking i don't see anything in the chat or in the q a I, I do i do have one final just a a question for you that you can mull it or not sure. a agency came to me and said we're trying to figure out how to do a paramedic salary and i contacted several of my my peer my friends my whatever and got numerous comments about you can't have a salaried paramedic, things like that. So just mull, mull that over for a well, bit. If you I'll want. just quickly tell you a quick answer on that, is that do not mistake salary with exempt, right? I can be salary, but I have to make sure that when I'm, I'm non-exempt salary, so when that person exceeds 40 hours, you have to you have to take their prorated amount, multiply it times time and a half, and pay them overtime. Make sense? I know what you're that's thinking right. is, well, then that's if not the really answer, salary. Yes, it the is. The answer is either hell no or yes, it'll work the way you said it would. But it was either My answer to them is, why in the hell would you do that? But that's my legal one, right? So the, the hell part is a Latin for that's just stupid, right? And as a guy, that, that brings up another question. So there are some services that average out the annual pay 
if you will. And so, especially like if you work on modified cells, sometimes you're paid four shifts in a pay period, sometimes you're paid five, sometimes you pay six. Yep. So if I were to average out so my employees get the same paycheck at least every time, because in theory, it should average out throughout the year, five shifts on every paycheck. So I don't pay them when they work six, I don't pay them when they work four, or cut their pay when they work four, because in theory, it should average out. Am I okay? Or should so, I? Yep, good question. Um, there is one permissible uh, variation from the Fair Labor Standards Act that's specific to um, those people working in like a firefighter schedule, right? That have a seven, you know, like basically an average, essentially averages out to be a 56 hour work or whatever, right? What I would suggest for you is to go to the Department of Labor's, uh, actually, I can send you the link for the way that's calculated. And where essentially you're coming up with a number that you know, one week they're doing 36, but the other two they're doing, and the average is 40, right? There is a permissible where you can drag it out over a longer period of time. That being said, again, um, I would, as I was doing that, and I, like I said, I can send you the fact sheet on this from the Department of Labor that talks very specifically about how this is done. Where most people run into a challenge, in my opinion, with paying employers, please, it is primarily because they have started or decided to pay a shift bonus or a shift stipend, and they have forgotten that that then changes the entire overtime calculation. So, hey, we've got a Saturday differential or we got a dispatch. So, you know, three days a week they work on the street. One day they work in dispatch. The dispatch rate is $2 more an hour. You have to do what's called the weighted average overtime calculation, which means you create the weighted average straight pay, multiply it times time and a half. And you end up with a different result than you would normally have if, let's say, for example, I worked dispatch my higher paid rate at the beginning of the week. And then at the end of the week, when I started going overtime, I was at my lower rate. It's not time and a half of the lower rate. It's time and a half of an average, or basically a weighted average straight rate that then gets multiplied times time and a half. But that's another one I can, I can run through for you if you need to. Okay, and we're going a little bit longer. I understand, but uh, when, even if you could average it out, you could you could figure out what that calculation is. How do shift grades go into that? Because shift grades <laughs> could be, now I'm working an extra shift above because I traded somebody. Um, and what happens if for some reason that trade didn't work out because somebody got sick, they got hurt, so they weren't even able to pay back that trade. So somebody ended up working more hours than they normally would, even with that trade. Does that You're make liable. sense? You're liable. Huh? You're liable. Here's you what mean? I'll tell you. I tell all EMS and fire-based employers to get away from that average schedule. That that I just tell them, I'm like, look, pay your people for the hours they work. Just pay them for the hours they work, period. Straight up, when they're at overtime, you pay them overtime. When they're if they if they have the week where they're working thirty six, then that week they're working thirty six. Do yourself the favor and get away from that un, unneeded, complicated process completely. That's just my opinion. But all right, I think we are at break. Yep. So fifteen cool. minutes. Yeah, fifteen minutes. I guess that'd you be. Tell uh, me when to come back. Uh, I, uh, I locked my butt to this chair for the afternoon. So okay. well, let's let's come back at uh, uh, five till. Five till. I'll see you then.